action, the, the, the way the image is blurred uh, across different chromatic channels. So the way the relative amount of blur we have in the red, uh, green, and blue channels, you see that that actually carries with it some information about the depth. So nearby objects will have uh, blue blurred more and far away objects will have the, the, the red blurred more. So then we can have another reconstruction process that extracts depth from, uh, from this image. And of course, the, the phase mask that we need for this process might be, and actually is, very different. It, it needs to be optimized on purpose for this task. And this is the, these are the depth images that we are, we are producing. Of course, it's very difficult to, to compare such an imaging system to, to some ground truth, but we did these comparisons. It cannot compete with active uh, imaging systems, obviously, but just remember, this is a single aperture, a single shot, completely passive imaging system. So it gets, uh, in terms of quality, it gets to light field arrays, which are, of course, much bigger and much more expensive. Um, now the next application I would like to I would like to mention, uh, still related to regular optical imaging, uh, um, just to just just as a reminder of, uh, of probably everyone everyone saw this uh, I think amazing movie. Now there is the second the second version called Planet Earth. This was the, the most expensive documentary, you know, I think budgeting about $25 million, million dollars back in 2005. And this is the hardware that was used to take those amazing uh, aerial shots of animals in the, in the wilderness. Today, it can be probably captured, I would dare say, better with this handheld device that costs 1,000 bucks. But still, if you look at the at the, the imaging system at the camera, the most expensive part, and expensive not just in terms of the bill of materials, also weight and, uh, and of course the cost and the system cost, the power cost that it takes is the gimbaled, mechanically stabilized uh, camera. So basically what we tried to do is to emulate the gimbal uh, um, entirely digitally. So, well, the way it can be done, you can take a fast camera, and by fast, I don't really mean something that runs at 10,000 uh, frames per second, something that runs at a few hundreds frames per second, which is which is very standard hardware nowadays. Your cell phone can probably do 200, 240 frames per second without a problem. So we take a, a fast burst of frames, and now we would like from that burst of frames that are blurred and suffer from uh, from uh, from other problems. We'd like to reconstruct a video at regular frame, uh, regular FPS, let's say 50 or 60 FPS, that uh, doesn't have the uh, the shaking because of the platform mode. So the, the problem can be roughly seen as first align the images in the burst. They are misaligned before because of the motion. Then once you have the aligned burst, you need to solve. Uh, simultaneous denoising and deblurring problem because if you have long exposures of the frames, you have uh, a problem of motion blur, right? Because the, the, the camera is moving. And if you have short exposures of the frames, then uh, blur is less important, but the noise becomes uh, becomes dominant because the exposure is short. So basically, what we did was just good, I think, engineering of uh, with standard tools. Uh, it's actually not not very trivial, but it works pretty well. Solving simultaneously denoising and blurring and image align, alignment of blurred and uh, low uh, SNR images. Uh, it actually works well. And this is what you can see on a resolution target. This digital gimbal system should get much better uh, MTF and, and better SNR than, than, the, than the regular imaging. But I think what is more interesting is that you can also learn some parameters that pertain to the sensor itself. Like for example, the exposure times, the way you would allocate the exposure budgets in the, in the burst. And of course, this is something that pertains to the hardware of the, of the camera. So with the learned, uh, with the learned uh, um, burst timing, we saw a, sometimes a very dramatic increase in the quality of the, of the reconstruction. So just, just uh, just confirming that that this that learning the imaging part is as important as learning the uh, the digital reconstruction part. So this is I think this picture captures 
interestingly different uh, phenomena that happen in, uh, in this imaging system. So the vertical axis is the mean illumination in photoelectrons on the, on the sensor. And the uh, horizontal axis is the mean blur in the number of pixels. So first of all, you see when going vertically, when the number of uh, photoelectrons, the number of photons that the system collects becomes low, it tends to allocate one of the frames, at least to long exposure. So what you can see in the insert here is the uh, burst timing. We have a burst of three frames. The bigger is the column, the, the longer is the exposure. So, so in low noise, in, in high noise, in low illumination uh, situations, uh, the, the system tends to allocate more time, at least one of the frames to get a uh, better SNR and then compensates the, the, for the blur uh, by taking uh, additional short exposure frames. When the illumination becomes uh, more abundant, of course, this flattens out. Also, in, when the amount of blur increases, this tendency to have a, a long exposure, a long, long exposed frame becomes less and less pronounced again because the amount of blur starts being unbearable. I think this is another interesting, uh, interesting image. So what is shown here, there are three frames in the blur encoded by different colors. The reference frame to which everything is aligned is the middle, is the green. And what you see encoded, encoded in the RGB colors is the relative contribution of, uh, in, for each pixel from each of the frames in the input to the, to the output frame. So if we just use regular uh, deblurring, most of the contribution comes from the middle frame and the, uh, the, frame, the frame exposure is uniform. Now with the same overall budget for the output frame, if we use learned non-uniform allocation, you can see that except for edges where high frequency information is, is important, uh, all the input pixels are used. So you have this neutral gray, uh, gray tone for all the pixels. And in the edges, the middle frame is used, which is uh, also learned to be exposed at the shortest time in order to maintain the high frequency information. And this is just, just a real setting with a real camera. We didn't actually put it on a drone or actually we, we already did, but I don't have these images. But this is a simulated setting where instead of flying the camera on the drone, we have it shaken by, by a drone engine. So the vibrations were actually matched in terms of their frequency and amplitude. And you can see what the camera sees with the digital gimbal reconstruction, I think this is uh, quite remarkably better than, than uh, state-of-the-art denoising and, and blurring algorithms that, that at least we, we had access to. Another set of applications that I would like to, I would like to uh, uh, very briefly talk about is in the domain of uh, medical imaging. But basically, I think medical imaging in general, it, it, of course, it is an important domain of imaging and computational imaging in particular. But I think what is interesting about medical imaging is that it has some active component. Uh, you need to transmit energy in some form into the, into the scene, into the object of interest in order to get an image. And because typically the transmission is under at least some control, we have more learnable degrees of freedom that we can work with. So we can uh, learn what we, we transmit as well as what we receive. So the first application, which is I think obvious in this sense is ultrasound. So in ultrasound uh, or ethography, uh, the way the image is, uh, uh, is acquired is by sending uh, an acoustic pulse, which uh, then bounces back from uh, from discontinuities in acoustic impedance. And we, we hear this echo, receive it in the, in the receiver and form the image. So typically the same device is used for transmitting and receiving. There are typically no moving parts. It's just a phased array of uh, um, ultrasonic transducers that uh, by delaying and summing uh, multiple, uh, multiple lines of signals uh, create a focused beam. And, uh, and then can sweep this thing with the focus beam. And on the way back, the same way we, we form the beam with the transmit beam former, we form the image with the receive beam form. So again, it's, it's pretty, pretty straightforward signal processing. I, I don't have time to, to, to show it with, uh, with equations, but it's, it's pretty straightforward. 
So basically what we tried, what we tried to, uh, the application we tried to deal with are uh, imaging of fast moving objects like cardiac imaging in, in, in previous. So, so the, the way the regular ultrasound works is by sweeping, as I said, uh, the scene with, uh, with a focused beam. Now this can be prohibitively expensive for fast moving, uh, moving objects because the sweeping is slow. So the regular protocol, there are two regular solutions to, to this problem. One is to defocus the beam and sweep faster, like what is called multi-line acquisition. Or another possibility is to send multiple beams separated by a certain angular separation. And again, you can sweep faster because you acquire multiple echoes from, from, distant, uh, from distant reflectors, distant in the angle. But both suffer from artifacts, of course. So in case of multi-line acquisition, you obviously defocus, you get lower resolution. And the multi-line transmission, you have low contrast and many uh, kinds of artifacts that are difficult to correct. So what we tried to do is to learn the receive beam former. So we, we, we transmit the regular, uh, the regular pulses with, with the multi-line or uh, um, so basically, with with one of the possible one one of the possible ways that I, I described, and then we learn how to beamform the received signal to produce a better image. So it actually produces quite better image. For example, here the the the, the acceleration factor was times six, so six times uh, less uh, beams were collected, and the image with the with the learned beamformer actually suffers from from much uh, much smaller artifacts, both objectively and subjectively. And don't ask me what uh, doctors actually managed to see in these images because it looks like noise, but, but apparently they contain a lot of anatomic details. But I think what is more interesting is actually to learn the transmission as well. And we actually saw that when we learn the transmission together with the, with the, uh, with the received beamformer, we see patterns that First of all, they don't look like focused beams or don't even look like beams at all. This is something that you would never probably configure your machine to auto transmit. But in concert with the learned beamformer, actually the machine produces uh, better images again, free from, from at least with, with smaller artifacts. You can, you can roughly increase the acquisition time by a factor of three with comparable uh, image quality in this setting. So another another kind of uh, medical imaging that I would like to I would like to mention that we also uh, tried adventuring into using again the same uh, the same notion the same idea of uh, of learning the, the imaging system is the magnetic resonance imaging. So just for those who don't know how this amazing machine works. Uh, it takes advantage of the uh, nuclear magnetic resonance uh, phenomenon, which tells that if you put uh, protons or actually any spins in, inside very strong magnetic field, they will, they will align uh, along the direction of the magnetic field. And then when you excite them with radio frequency at a very specific uh, resonant frequency that depends on the strength of the magnetic field, they will, uh, they will uh, change their orientation and then tend to return back to the original state while emitting signal. So basically, they will. It's like like uh, hitting uh, hitting a bell. It will it will resound back. It will, it will emit the transmitted uh, energy back at the resonant frequency. So the way MRI machine that with uh, uh, magne magnetic resonance imaging works is we put the object of interest into a strong magnetic field, which is created by the superconductive uh, magnets. And then, so how do we get an image, right? Basically all the spins, the spins in, in case of MRI are hydrogen atoms that exist in water and in, in, uh, in other biological molecules like fat and proteins and so on. So, so uh, how do we get an image? Because all the spins will transmit simultaneously when we excite them. So the, the, the way the spatial coding is produced is by, by creating a gradient in the intensity of the, of the uh, magnetic field. So then different uh, locations in space will have different resonant frequency and will 
will emit their, radio, their radio frequency.